Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Bendenun, and it is a blessing to get this chance to speak with you guys once again. And um, uh, actually, I'm, I've been I was doing some studies last night uh, over in Genesis, back at the beginning of God's Word. Um, and I was just reading in Hebrew because it's just sometimes much more of a blessing when you can, by His grace, understand the anointed language that God wrote his word in. I know there's a lot of controversy of some of the things I've been teaching lately here, and uh, and we'll be moving on pretty shortly here into some other areas. Again, some of the things that uh, people appreciate so much uh, about Revelation, the things that are going on, the prophecies, the events that are happening in the world, but there's just serious issues that need to be addressed, and the Lord's just really dealt um, uh, heavily on my heart about these things. And so I haven't been able to quite move out of this as of yet. Uh, but there's some things that I'm going to want to still address with you because uh, occasionally I'm able to see some of the comments and, and respond back. Um, one of the things, of course, is in behind me there, the flag of Israel with the Star of David. I know there's those that have some thoughts of its origin. Uh, I will help you to understand that is an error. Uh, we'll get to that later. That needs to be really a separate video by itself. We have quite a few historical documents uh, that are archaeological finds that prove that the Star of David is synonymous with Israel and not because of an occultic practice either. But we'll go into that a little bit later. Also, the kippah. Now, that's another thing that, of course, it's not a biblical commandment. So let me just set that straight. Uh, a lot of people that know me that have known me for a long time have known I've spoke about that in the past. I don't wear it for the sake of of any biblical commandment. I do it for the sake of my own people. As Paul said, I became all man, saving that I might win some. So my own people that are Jews, because I am a Jew myself, uh, it, it helps them to listen if they feel like that I'm keeping what they think is, is right in the sight of God. So therefore, there are things that I do that you're definitely not required to do. And, and uh so altogether different situations. So anyway, um, this here, I wasn't even planning on going back into anything about um, equality. But uh, last night as I was reading over in Genesis, uh, which I'll take you there to Genesis in a few minutes, I, I really felt the need to address this because I understand um, by God's grace, exactly what gives women the liberty to be able to speak in God's behalf. And I think it would help men to understand that better too, and it might help them to be able to grasp it better. So it's not just message to liberate women, this is really to liberate men as well for that understanding because we get so many scruples and so many confusions. Uh, in Judaism, we have the same problem. Uh, we have taught so much Talmudic tradition, so much uh, of the tradition of the sages that we lose focus on what's really right. And, and in some of their commentaries, they're very interesting. In fact, to, to, the, I'm going to give you a Talmudic uh, quotation in this message today because it was one of the few that are actually on the Word of God. Uh, and I'll take it a little deeper so that my rabbi, rabbinical brethren, would be able to understand a little bit better as well, too. So without any further ado, let's, I'd like to first take you to the scripture in the Christian Bible in Galatians 3.28. Uh, please don't get offended when I say that. I say that for the sake of my Jewish brothers uh, out there as well. Uh, if I just say the Bible and go to certain, certain places, I do believe that the Christian Bible is, uh, is the new covenant uh, for my Jewish brethren. They quite don't understand that. And so... We just need to have a little bit of understanding there. But you got to remember, many of the rabbinical scholars have studied deeply the Christian Bible, such as I have myself. And, um, and we see things there that, that kind of trouble us. And some of those I've been pointing out to you. But it's, we, sometimes, we have that sometimes in the Hebrew translations, not in the Hebrew text itself. We don't have any problems there. Same thing with you guys. And your Greek originals, they're right on the money. Those writings that were written in Greek were right on the money. Uh, but we can see where the translation has been a little biased in areas to try to maintain an agenda. Let me take you to Galatians 3.28. This is one that a lot of sisters that, that use this in order to be able to, um, 
to give to give themselves a voice and of course men try to take take it the other way but I'm going to take you into a deeper depth with it so you understand it better though Galatians 3:28 says there is neither let me back up just a little bit. Let's, let's go ahead and go to verse 23 but before uh, bef- but before faith came we were kept under the law shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed Hmm, interesting, isn't it? Shut up, closed in. That's one reason why you had the Jewish tradition of the women remain in silent. It is a Talmudic uh, uh, oral law that is not a law of God. Okay? Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. See, what is the law really? The law uh, allows us to see what is right and wrong. Is that right? It's just like the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You know, so that's what Israel won us, what we got. We got a law. So anyway, uh, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, you're no longer under a schoolmaster. Sounds like a restoration. Uh, For you are the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Now, this is only this only applies to you if you're in Christ. So keep that in mind. Even sisters that feel that you have a call to speak on God's behalf, if you're not in him, you should not be speaking the word of God, period. That also goes for the brethren. Ministers, if you are not men, that is, men ministers, that are not in Christ Jesus, you have no right to speak God's word. You are, you are to remain silent until you are in him. So... I'm going to show you, sisters, how you become identified as man. Interesting. Seems it seems to be a male-dominated place, right? All right. But after that, faith has come. We are no longer under the schoolmaster, for you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, some guys like to go back. Of course, they go into all the different scriptures that we've already dealt with. Timothy, Corinthians, you know. Especially the one where it talks about that the... uh, The deacons and the the, uh, uh, bishops... Interesting word, isn't it? <laughs> so they are to be the husband of one wife. Oh, I love that one there. They say right there that proves that men are supposed to be the ministers. Deacons are supposed to be men. And they're to also uh, have only one wife. Well, there again, we won't go in deep into that. But let me explain to you why he says one wife. Because Paul and Timothy, they're dealing with the problem of polygamy in the days of Christ as well. Because polygamy was permissible to some degree, but when Christ comes, Christ is restoring the word. The restoration, there was only one man, one woman, Adam and Eve, and those two became one. A father and mother, you know, as it says, the, the, husband, the man shall leave his mother and father and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Is that right? Beautiful, isn't it? I love it. Already love it. So, so therefore, uh, once you leave your father and mother, man, once you get away from mama and daddy there and you cleave to your wife, you're supposed to become one. It's the same thing when you come to Christ. Yes, before then, you're male and female. But in the beginning, it was one male, one female. They cleaved together and God made them one. They were no longer male and female once they're in as one. Now they become Adam, or man, or mankind, all right? We're going to get into that in a few minutes there. So the point is, is that when Christ came, he came to restore the word back to the way it was in the Garden of Eden, back to one man, one woman. So as the ministers of the gospel are beginning to be set up, they're running into a problem automatically where men are coming in with multiple wives. And so... Paul has to set this in order. You're to be the husband of one wife, not two, three, four, five. See, you have to be the husband of one wife. And he didn't have to address this to sisters. Why? 
because they didn't have multiple husbands, you know. If, they, if he had to address it to them, he would have addressed it, addressed it with them. Um, anyway, though, uh, and there's scriptures plainly that talk about, uh, Paul talks about, uh, you know, different women in the Bible that he exhorts, you know, the helper. She's a helper of mine, a companion of mine, the, you know, uh, in the Lord. Uh, there's a sister mentioned in there that her, her and her church, her home church, she is a head, she's a leader of the church. Uh, we, I, I wish I had some of these marked down, but I don't because I didn't want to spend a long time today with this message. I just wanted to kind of go right into it for you. But anyway, uh, so the point is, is he's addressing it like that. You have to restore it back. But for the sake of those men that think, well, oh, no, bless God, it's got to be a man. All right, I'll, I'll help you see that sisters are considered man, if that's what you believe. Remember, though, he says, there is neither Jew nor Greek. These are those that are in Christ. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And let me tell you something, brothers. The way I told you the other day, until you begin to recognize or, or to look at your sister as a sister in Christ, you should see Christ. You should not see female and you should not see sisters you shouldn't see male you should see christ in that individual and if you don't see christ in the individual then maybe they shouldn't be up there preaching in the first place but you have to be in christ and then you can preach the gospel if god's called you for that purpose so all right let's take a look and i hate to tell you this but once i read this to you here uh, it's going to probably disappoint some more of my dear friends that are very attached to the King James Version Bible. You know, I know there's a lot of translations out there. And quite frankly, I do like the King James Version in a lot of respects because in some respects it's a little bit more literal and I appreciate that about it. Uh, but as I told you, they're human beings that, that were translating it. And for those that don't believe it, yes, they made mistakes. Not just on women, by no means, believe me. They did it the same thing with the Hebrew language as well. The difference is, is we know the Hebrew language, uh, those of us that do understand it, and so therefore, we can see when you make the mistakes. pretty obvious to us. So, uh, but I'm going to prove it to you. Uh, and I'm not here to try to prove a mistake. I just happened when I was studying last night, I ran across another one. And, and it's important that you understand this, though, because it also deals with doctrinal issues that people have created out of this. Um, this is, uh, this is we, we get over here, um, and we're in the fourth chapter. This is of Genesis, and this is where, um, let me take you, go back here to the beginning of the fourth chapter. And when you start off uh, in the fourth chapter, it's where Cain and Abel are coming along. We know that Cain kills his brother, etc. A lot happens in the fourth chapter here. Uh, when we get to verse 25, I don't know if that's the same way in King James or not as far as the layout of your Bible. I'm not looking at the King James right now. I'm just I'm looking at a Hebrew Bible. Uh, but let me just read to you here from verse 25 in the fourth chapter of Genesis. Uh, I hope that's right for you guys. You'll, you'll know where it's at if I'm not in the same place for you. You have to keep in mind the Hebrew Bible is laid out a little bit different. Uh, in some cases, the verses are not matched up the same in yours. Like in the book of Malachi, you guys have chapter 4. We don't have a chapter 4. It's chapter 3. Still, you have all the same wording. It's just the way we laid it out is a little differently. Okay, so it says here, Vayadea Adam od et ishto, and Adam uh, again knew his wife. Um, in other words, they were going to have a child. Vetaled ben Vetikra, and she bore a son and called et Shemo his name, uh, Shet, or Seth, I think is how you say it in English, Seth. Kishatli uh, Elohim. And uh, let's see if it, uh, it, literally the way you translate that because uh, because he provided uh, God. In other words, she's saying that God has provided for her. Zara echad echad Another seed or another child, 
uh, in place of uh, Abel, ki hagul kain, uh, who, who Cain actually killed. Now, it's going to go a little bit into the genealogy now, as after Seth is born. So it says, Ulasheth gam, and also Seth, Hu yeled ben veikara, he also had a son, and he called et shemo, and he called his name Enosh. Not, that's not Enoch, by the way, that's Enosh. Uh, I think he's pronounced the same way in, in English, Enosh. Um, and then it says, uh, when he, after, and this is right after the birth of Enosh, Says as huchal likra b'sham yaiyoe, or Hashem, the Lord. I'm, I'm pronouncing it a little different than probably what you're used to. Uh, the, and now in King James, you guys, let me let me get a King James real quick because I need to read this. Um, and I'm really amazed at how many scrupled up versions are on this, and I haven't. When I say scruple up, you know, there are some Bibles out there, and I'm not really crazy about some of their translations, like the NIV, that at least has a decency to put some footnotes in there when things are not translated right, or things that were added to the King James Version, and they don't say King James, but were added to the Bible that are customary, but were not in the original Greek text. So I really like, I like seeing that. Uh, because unless you know Greek, you won't know that. And see, for me, I don't know the Greek language. I only know the Hebrew language, so it's a little different there. All right, let's see here in chapter 4. Yeah, it is. It is in, it in verse 25, chapter 4. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God, um, wait a minute. For God, said she, hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel, whom Cain slew. Let me just look at that. That may be something there, too, that I didn't... See in Hebrew. Let me just back up just a little bit. Kishatli Elohim Zara Echat Echat Chaval. Oh, wow. Doesn't say any. The, the word uh, said she is not in Hebrew. Well, even I notice it's italicized in the King James. It's something that's injected. They're, they're assuming that she's saying this. And bare a son and called his name Seth. Okay, his wife again. And she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God hath appointed me another seed. So it's, it's added word there. It's not, it's not in the Hebrew either. I, just, I didn't realize that. But uh, okay, anyway. So uh, as we go on though, let me read to you verse 26. And to Seth to him also there was born a son... And he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Now, that's what you read, and it makes it look like that after the birth of Seth's son, Enosh, suddenly everybody became righteous. But it's totally contrary to what's written in Hebrew. It does not say Enosh, and then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. It says absolutely the opposite of that. And I'm going to prove it to you so you understand why I say this. Okay. Enosh az huchal likra b'sham yayoe. Okay. Now, if it were to say, and then man began to call, we would have to have the word began to call. It does say az then. That's correct. Az is then. Huchal likra. Likra is to call. But Chuchal doesn't have any word in there with man. It doesn't suppose the word man in there. It doesn't say man. It doesn't say ish. It doesn't say, um, uh, doesn't say the word male. It doesn't say the word adom for the word man. It doesn't say man, period. In reality, it says Chuchal, which literally means it or it was profaned. So in the words, after Enosh was born, then it was profaned or it became profaned to call in the name of the Lord, God's divine name. It became profaned. It became, uh, it was like an, un, un, it was not righteous anymore. It was done in, in, an, in, 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 a, in a, 
oh gosh, perverse way. And it makes more sense when we read this because something had to have gone wrong and normally it's attributed, you know, to, well, they just fell and uh, when, they, when man fell, you know, they blame it on the Nephilim and things like that, you know, and uh, we know that God sees that all kind of evil comes into the world at this, you know, at some point in time that he has to destroy the world. And God writes it in there when it began. It didn't begin with Seth, but after his son is born, Enosh, that's when it takes place. Now, you might say, okay, by the way, the word man in Hebrew is Adom, all right? I just want to set some records straight for you here so you understand this a little bit better. Uh, and the word Ish is what he called Adom when he was in spirit form. Many times in the scripture, it's still, it's still that way there as well. Zachal is the word for male, okay? But we don't have the word chal, which is actually the word here for profane. It Chal doesn't sound like Adam. Chal doesn't sound like Zachal. Chal does not sound like Ish. Sounds nothing like it. So to say that, and then man begin to call upon the name of the Lord is totally contrary to the word of God. Now, for your sake, too, I took and I decided, okay, I know you guys have uh, some kind of things you can look up things if you want to see what words are actually used, if you're able to see the Hebrew word. But I just decided myself just to show you some of the places in the, in the Tanakh where we use the word profane so that you would be able to see this for yourself as well. Um, and one of them is in Amos uh, chapter 2. In verse 7, uh, it says here in the English language, and again, I'm using, um, I'm just going to read it to you from, from Hebrew as well. And, I'm, and I'm, I'm like near the very end of the verse, and a man and his father will go in the same girl, go into the same girl, a man and his father will go into the same girl to profane my holy name. Well, you know, it's actually kind of interesting that it says it because if you'll notice also, it wasn't long after Enosh's birth is when the sons of God looked at the daughters of man that they were fair and they took into themselves uh, uh, women. Now, they didn't marry them. They just, they were sleeping around with one another. So this here it says, and a man and his father will go into the same girl to profane my holy name. So God's holy name is being profaned and we really don't see an in indication to where um, they were marrying them, although I think that's the way you translate it in English in there, but, uh, they, but they actually were just living with them. Um, so, but in Hebrew, so you can understand it as well, um, it says right here, Lama'an, Chalal, see, Chal again, profane, et Hashem, uh, Kodashi, profane my holy name. The word, it's, it's, in, a, it's in a compound like it is here, Huchal, and here is Chalal, which means profane to it or directly to the name of God was being profaned because the men and the sons were both sleeping with the same girl. Uh, in another place in Ezekiel, when Israel profanes God's holy name uh, because they were out of their homeland, uh, it says here, but I had concern for my holy name. This is Ezekiel 36, verse 21 which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations. Okay, so, and uh, again, in Hebrew, we read here, uh, let me find the corresponding verse here. Um, okay. It says right here, Al Shem Kodeshi, my holy name, Asha Chalilehu Bait Yisrael. Again, the word chal, again, right there at the very beginning, the word profaned, they, prof they had profaned my holy name. See? Among the nations. Chalei bayit Yisrael bagoim. See, they profaned his holy name, name before the nations. So chal is clearly, I want to give you two witnesses there because that's what people want, two witnesses there. Chal is the word profaned. And therefore, now you know that God's name had been profaned there. Uh, and that's how the things got scrupled up. All right, so now let's get right back to what the main part of this was. I just wanted to share that with you so you can see that this is how doctrines get started out. So a lot of people believe that, 
wow, this is, you know, when Seth came along, that this was the righteous seed of God and everything. Uh, you know, the reason why God had to appoint her another seed was because one, Cain became a murderer, so, you know, judgment. And by the way, when he said um, uh, seven generations would come, it was after the seventh generation that the flood came from this time that Cain does what he does. Uh, but also we see that Abel is dead. Cain is now marked. So she has no children. She has no sons left. So of course she needs another, another seed, another child. Uh, but because the fall had already set in as a result of Adam and Eve's sin, it, it doesn't make any difference. It's still all messed up. All right, so anyway, so God shows that there, that now the name of God had, had, became, had become profane from the time of Enosh. Then he changes the scope of things. Um, and he talks about, uh, in, in the very next chapter, chapter 5, um, in Genesis here, he says, um, Elohim. Okay, this is this is the account of the descendants of Adams on the day of the crea that God created man in the likeness of God. All right, this is important here now. In the likeness of God, uh, asa oto, uh, he made him. Now, here's where we get the beautiful part. This is where you're going to find out that sisters have a right to speak on God's behalf. It says in verse 2, Zacha unekeva. Zacha, male, unekeva, and female. Baram, created, that's in the plural. Ubarach, excuse me, veyubarach, and he blessed. He's blessing them in the singular. Otam, them, but they're blessed in the plural. It's a single blessing. Because why? He's making them one. He's making male and female one. Ve'ikara et shemam. And he called, speaking about God, God called their name. See, Shem is just name. Shemam is their name. Adam, man. Ve'yom habara'am. Yahi Adam. On the day they were created, and Adam lived. Okay, so Adam lived. It doesn't mean that Adam, a singular, lives. It is Adam. He said he called their name Adam, or man, or mankind. You see what I'm saying? And because see, we, we find out that God gives them dominion over everything. Even when Eve is separated from Adam, they're given dominion over everything. So when, when God says in his word in Galatians 3.28, when he says, for as many of you have, that have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. They became one. They became from, they went from being male, zacha unekeva. They went from being male and female and they became Adam. They became man. A female becomes a man. A woman becomes what? In other words, they become neither male nor female. Now they're created as one unit. Now, does it not say as well? Um, just trying to see if it was right here. I don't think it is. Uh, the, the scripture there. For, for this reason shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become what? One flesh. If you go back to the beginning of God's creation, you are to become one like Adam and Eve were one. When Adam and Eve were one, the Bible clearly says, hang on one second here, that he gave them dominion. Now we find that 
in Genesis 1.26. I'll read it to you from, from, from King James here for you. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea. All right, now, let me take you to Hebrew with that. Oh, by the way, you want to, I'll take you a little something deeper on that too. They're going to have dominion over the fish in the sea. Now, how are you going to have dominion? How are you going to be able to rule or to lead fish in the sea? I often think about um, when you go to like SeaWorld in, in, in Orlando or something like that. We've been there many times. My daughter is in love with Shamu. And, uh, and you see how, especially back when they could actually be a part of the animals and their, and their activities there, how that they could intermingle with them. And this is even after the fall. And the animals would respond. Uh, no doubt they had the ability you have to remember, if Christ could walk on water, what do you think Adam and Eve could do? They had dominion on the fish in the sea. I've even wondered if they had the ability to go under with them the water. I don't see why not. It's just kind of just a little thought to throw in there. So, All right, so we have here verse uh, 26. The Yomer Elohim Nasha Adom. And God said, let us make man. The problem you make you brothers, is that you keep making man an individual unit. You keep making him male. God said, let us make man in in our image. In our likeness. They will do and they shall rule be the God over the fish Hayom of the sea, Uva of, and the birds, Hashemaim of the sky. And he gets into the rest of it, over the whole earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Now, notice what he says. They shall rule. They, uh, they iradu. They shall rule. That little vav with that little dagish in it makes it they. Hmm. There's another one too, by the way, on that. I got to share with you there. And it's about, well, I know what it is. Let me just share this with you while I'm thinking about it right now. My wife asked me about this the other day. When uh, God called Abraham and Sarah, there is a scripture on that here for you. In Isaiah 51, and... Um, don't think King James is going to get this right either in the translation. Even in the Jewish Bible, when they do it in English, they don't translate it like it should be. Hearken to me, ye that follow after righteousness. You that seek the Lord, look to the rock whence you are hewn and to the hole of the pit from which you were dug out. And by the way, that rock is Christ. It is the Messiah. Look to... But now he's going to take you back and show you something here. This is really interesting. Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah that bore you. Then it, here's where it comes. For he was but one when I called him, and I blessed him and increased him. Hmm. Now, it's actually mistranslated right there. But they're doing it intention. Well, they do it maybe because they, I don't know if they don't understand what it is, who it is. Okay, anyway, so it says right here. Habitu el Abraham ha'vichem el Sarah ta'halalechem. See? Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, your mother. Sarah's the mother of all of us in the way it's being presented here. Ki echad karati Tiv. Okay? Because one was he when I called him. But then it says, Verachahu, Verabehu. And what is that right there? He says here, For he was but one when I called him. That's correct. 
And I blessed them, not him. And increased them, not him. But it is correct to say he was one when I called him. Why? Because God had finally got a male and a female and had got them one like Adam and Eve. That's what happened. He had a Zechariah and a Keva. He had a male and a female that had become one. And they were in one heart and one mind and one accord, even to the point of they both laughed at the idea that she would be young and have a child. They were truly one. They disbelieved together. They believed together. Adam and Eve did the same thing too, didn't they? Interesting, isn't it? So when we come back over here, and this is what's interesting. It says here, V'yomer Elohim na'asa adom betzelamanu ki demachutenu and God said, let us make a man in our image, in our likeness. They are a do. And we translate they, that they shall rule. Bedegat hayom ha'of ha'shemaim over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air. But do you really realize that that little vav at the end with the dagish there literally does not mean the word they, it means our. It's stronger than they. It puts them together, doing it together. It's like, for example, when you preach the gospel, if you just preach the gospel, if it's they, it gives you the authority to preach and the other one that's inside of you, you're not one. You might go this direction and the other one might go that direction. But when it is our, it belongs to both of us and therefore we both have one mind and one accord to be able to speak on behalf of God. Why? Because you become one with Christ. When you are in Christ Jesus, according to Galatians uh, uh, 3, two, excuse me, one twenty six, it says that... that uh, Excuse me, I'm, looking, I'm in the wrong one there. 328. Galatians 328. There is neither male nor female. There is neither free nor bond. There is neither Greek nor Jew. They're all one in Christ. Jesus said, I would that day that, 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 that they shall know that, 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 that I am in the Father, the Father is in me, and I am in you, and you are in me. So when you get one with Christ... When you become really one with him, it is no more they, it's no more you and him, it becomes one, it becomes our. And you're made in his likeness, you're made in his image. Jesus said, I, do, I say nothing except what the Father shows me. It was oneness like that. Abraham and Sarah had become one. And yes, when he says here, let me take you back to the part about Abraham and Sarah right here, because this one is just incredibly beautiful here. 50, chapter 51. See? Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, your mother, excuse me, Sarah, that bore you. For he was but one when I called him. Why does he say him in the singular right there? And then he says, right after he says, after I called him, let me get back where it says, oh, there's a small, small print in my Tanakh that I have here. Called him, and I blessed them and increased them. Why does it say him? Because when God said in Genesis, I'm getting excited, I'm sorry, guys, sisters, brothers, whatever's listening there. But I am so excited here. When God created in Genesis chapter 4 here, or is it in chapter, I'll go to chapter 5 with that? Yes, chapter 5, sorry, chapter 5. And we get over right here. Oh, praise be to God. Yes, here we go. Hmm. Elohim Adam Bidamot. Elohim. I'm missing. Oh, I went the wrong way. Sorry, guys. Here we go. In Gen uh, uh, Genesis chapter 5, verse 2, Zacha unakeva baram veyubocha otam veikra et shamam Adam. 
Do you know that even Adam is plural? Man, who comes from Adamat, the ground, which is a feminine, by the way. He comes from a feminine there. But it would be, in this case here, you would say he created you know, man. We call that singular. But it is like him. It's just like he said about Sarah. And that day when he became one, see, what was God doing right here? This is the beauty of all this. You guys got to see this. And by the way, for you guys that say that you like to point to Eve and say, you know, God said to Adam, will you hearken to the voice of your wife? Praise God. See, it meant that she wasn't supposed to speak. Well, it says over here also that uh, and, and, and with, with Sarah that when Sarah was saying something that seemed so contrary throughout this woman here, throughout this Hagar, this bonds made, that, and she gave him to her to have a child, giving to her as a wife, and she said, throw him out. He won't be with my son. And God said to Abraham, hearken unto the voice of thy wife. So you think women don't have a voice? God gave her a voice, didn't he? So we go back to 51 verse 2, and to Sarah that bore you. For he was but one when I called him. They had become one. See? And I blessed them. And increased to them. I know in King James you got it him. And I blessed him and increased him. But they had become one. See? Look at it. It's, so be it's just incredible to me. I, I just can't get over it. He was but one. Mm. Key. And, it, and, it, and by the way, it doesn't say he was but one. It says ki echad. For one. See? Karati, Karatif. He was called one. It doesn't say for he was one. He was called one. Why was he called one? Because he'd become one the way Adam and Eve was one. Him and his wife were one. Now, I'll take it one little step further and then we'll close. Some men take, when they look at in I believe it's in Timothy where it talks about the man of one wife, the deacon must be of one wife, rule their house well, et cetera, et stuff like that. By the way, you know, God gives the wife the dominion for the home. So think about that one for a little while. But if, and I have actually heard some ministers that believe that, well, you have to be married then, in that case, before you can preach. Uh, I thought that was kind of neat too. And in one way, I have to agree with them. You have to be married to Christ. See, Paul wasn't married, was he? At least you don't think he was married, but he was married. He was married to Christ. He had completed that union and become one with Christ. And that's what gave him a voice. Same thing with uh, the women that were speaking the word afterwards. The woman at the well, she'd accepted that word right there at the well. He said, if you knew who it was, I'd give you a drink and you'd come, you wouldn't have to come here anymore. She accepted it and became a minister of the gospel. Uh, many, many women were apostles and were uh, teachers. Scripture plainly bears that out after the resurrection as well. Because why? They had become one with Christ. But that's all we Paul would be able to speak if we were to take it literally the way we look at it. And that's really the way it should be. You have to be married to Christ to be one. I want to read to you, though, something that you may find of interest. And this is um, actually from the Talmud. So, for my Jewish brethren, and I'm going to take it, I told you I'd mention this to you, and I'll take it a little step further, and we'll close here. When they speak about the male and female, he created them. The Talmud comments that a man without a wife is not a man, for it is said male and female he created them, and goes on to say, and called their name man. And it states in uh, Yavamos 63a, only when a man is united with his wife can he be called man. So I'm going to take it a step further. Otherwise, you're just male and female. Only when you are united with Christ. 
Are you truly man? Because God said in the beginning, he was making them in his own image. In our image, he made them. Male and female. And he created them and called them man. Jesus said, in that day you will know that I am in the Father. The Father is in me. And I am in you. And you are in me. That's when you truly have that one spirit. You're no longer male or female. That's why it says there in there, there there's neither male nor female. Because when you truly have united with Christ, you're no longer male and female. You are Adon. You are man. You finally achieved what God called you to achieve. Otherwise, if you've not reached that perfection in Christ, you're just a woman or a man trying to speak the gospel, presuming presumptuously, or presuming, which means to adventure without authority. You're presumptuous about something, but you're not really sure of it. Maybe I should say it like that. And you have no business to handle the word of God until you're in him. God bless you. Shabbat Shalom. And we didn't do this one live because I knew I needed a little bit of time to look at some things. But God bless you. And I trust this is a blessing for you. Uh, hopefully I get to do the thing on the uh, six point star of David for you next. Uh, by the way, I know I've seen some people say that there's a... Uh, it's got the six with makes it 666. That's kind of ironic, rather stupid. There's seven chambers in the Star of David, not six. And it speaks of the six days and the seventh day he rested. The largest chamber is the seventh. God bless you. We'll talk about it soon. Baruch Hashem.